Good morning. So good to see you today. Thank you for coming. And we want to extend a special welcome to our visitors. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. We're very happy for you to be here. Uh, thank you for your prayers while we were away on vacation. Had a very relaxing time, a great time with family, and the uh, Lord provided safety for all of us, and uh, it was a, a good week. Appreciate Joshua filling in last week, listened to his message in the car. and I listened to the entire service in the car, and um, it was good. Very good, good exposition for us. Uh, a few announcements before we begin our worship service. Uh, a couple of things about today. Uh, we'll have a meeting, uh, first of all, a quarterly business meeting immediately after the service today. This will be a brief meeting. We're going to be presenting the financials and uh, the year-end review uh, for our past fiscal year. And following that, there'll be a meeting of those of us who'll be going on the trip to the Ark Encounter in the Creation Museum. And that will be immediately after the business meeting. Uh, announcement about the men's prayer breakfast. We'll not meet this Tuesday, but we'll begin meeting regularly again on July 25th. And please note the, the announcement about an upcoming ladies' Bible study. And uh, we hope that the, the women can have a good kickoff for that as well. There's a church-wide ensemble rehearsal today. Everyone is invited to participate today in a special uh, number that's going to be uh, presented next Sunday. And that will be in our choir room, which is the chapel down at the end of the corridor, around the corner here. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that. For the sake of our visitors, how we handle tithes and offerings here, you'll see in the back, there are wooden boxes on each side of the back, and there's one right here. We have three, and if the Lord leads you to make a donation today, those are the receptacles for that donation. We are not passing the plates currently, so uh, that's how we're going to have all that. Also remind the church that we're um, getting more and more people involved in the church uh, database app, which is Realm, and uh, there'll be lots of good features that are available through that app. And also for our life groups, announcements about when our next life groups are going to be meeting, you'll find that on the back of the uh, bulletin as well. Let's stand and join together in song, and let's remind ourselves of what we're doing. We are worshiping the living God the God of all glory, the God of all grace, the God who is the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we meet. And let's do this heartily as unto the Lord as we sing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before you humbly, acknowledging and confessing that we are unworthy of your grace and your mercy and your salvation. We come before you exultant in the fact that we are your children, that we are the sheep of your pasture. We thank you that you call us each one by name. We come before your throne of grace claiming the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We don't come in our own strength, Father. We come in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We cannot begin to come before you in our own righteousness, but we claim the righteousness of Christ. And Father, we come before you a thankful people that you've saved us, that you've provided for our every need, that you have comforted us, that you have quieted our stormy souls, and that you have given us a mind and a heart to serve you. We thank you for this group of people who've assembled together, that they took time on this Lord's day to be with God's people so that we could together, as a congregation, corporately praise you and glorify you. And Father, may we be encouraged by this time together that you might give us strong hearts, that you might build us up in the faith, that we might be strengthened with might in the inner man. And Father, that we might go forth today after this service is over, having said it's been good to be in the house of the Lord, that it's been good to be with God's people, and it's been glorious to be in your presence. Father, we come confessing our sin. We pray that you would forgive us for those things we've done this week that have not pleased you, that have not been in accordance with your word. And we praise you, Father, that you have declared our sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. Father, we come confessing that we do not always have hearts that are tuned to sing your praise. We do not always have minds that are held in the captivity of Christ. We don't always have a love for your word. We don't always treat it as sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Father, we are prone to wander. We know it and we feel it prone to leave the God we love. We pray that this passage today from Deuteronomy 13 would show us that our love for you and our obedience to you is manifested in seeking and destroying the idols of the heart. I beg you, Father, to give us new hearts, hearts of flesh and not of stone, that are receptive to your teaching, that are sensitive to your leading, and that are desirous to go forth and proclaim your gospel. I pray for the ones who are hurting here today. No doubt in a group this size, there are people bearing significant burdens. Perhaps the burden is physical health. Perhaps the burden is mental health. Perhaps the burden is uh, family-related, job-related, financially related. The burden can be things that we have no knowledge of. We pray that each of us would cast our cares on Christ who cares for us. And we claim the promise, Father, that we need to be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let our requests be made known to you, and we claim the promise that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we pray that everything we do today, every song, every prayer, the message, the conversations, the business meeting, everything we do today, We ask, Father, that you enable us to do it heartily as unto the Lord, and we pray for that strength in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day that you have made. Help us to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for your son. Um, Help us to always remember that we would be eternally lost without him. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this body of believers um, who gather every week to praise your name and to care for each other. Um, Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to be a thankful people and realize that everything that you have given us um, is not our own or is not because of what we've done to merit it, and it's purely a gift from you. And as we move into this time of um, giving, help us to give back to you out of thankfulness. Um, Help us as we leave here today to go out into the world and make your name famous and help us to love our neighbor um, and tell the world who you are. Uh, In your name, amen. Our scripture reading is from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. 
So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. I know now why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit most convinced the men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13.
We are now well into our study of Deuteronomy, and we'll be back in this book for some time. I think I shared with you some time back uh, about my high school days playing basketball. I wasn't really very good, but I did play. And I remember being taught in junior high by a crusty old basketball coach as I was playing in the middle as a center. He described my attitude in playing defense in that position. He said, but Paulson, do you see this rectangle here indicating the lane, the basketball lane? I said, yes, sir. All right, now, you're playing defense, right? Yes, sir. I want you to think of this rectangle as your house. This is your home. Now, when someone comes in who's not supposed to be there, I want you to think of them as a home invader. This person has come into this lane to hurt your mama. Now, what are you going to do? I didn't have the vocabulary then, but today I would have said something like, I will expel him from this lane. He is a home invader. He is dangerous. His mouth must be stopped, and his body must be shunned. Now, that's a very bad illustration of what the Bible has to say about idolatry and false teaching. It is an invasion of the house, and the invader must be silenced and expelled. This place must not tolerate in any way, shape, or form aberrant aberrant doctrine, false teaching, or anyone who tempts us to idolatry. What is idolatry? We can define it in a lot of ways. I like what Tozer says, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. That goes to the heart of what it means to be an idolater. It means you are entertaining thoughts about God And those thoughts are not worthy of who this God really is. Now, in Deuteronomy 13, and indeed the last few verses of Deuteronomy 12, the preacher Moses, the pastor of this gigantic flock, if you will, begins an exposition of essentially the Ten Commandments, though not in order and not in completeness. And he begins with the first commandment. You're not to have any gods before him. No other gods before my face. So he's essentially saying to this group of people, God has brought you out of the wilderness. God has redeemed you from Egypt. God has lovingly cared for you and brought you to the precipice of a wonderful land filled with milk and honey, a prosperous land, And indeed, as your God who loves you and cares for you, I'm in going before you into this land, and I'm going to drive out your enemies, and I'm giving you this good land. Now, when you get to this good land, you must not follow their gods. And you must not tolerate anyone, even from among you, who would lead you into that idolatry. Now we have to put some, obviously, New Testament parameters on this. We are God's people, but I don't think we are equated with Israel in that sense. We're not going in to possess a physical land. We're taking spiritual territory. God has not called us to burn down cities that go into idolatry. You know, you might say, well, I got a bad feeling about Malden. 
I'm investigating mold, and I think there's some bad teaching going on over there. Let's just go burn it, turn it into a huge heap as a memorial of the false teaching of mold. You know, that's not really what God is asking us to do in 2023, folks. But the New Testament writer John, at the very end of his first epistle, in which he talks about the person and work of Jesus Christ, where he gives us great, wonderful tests of the living faith, in which he declares that we are to be a loving, loving people. The last phrase of that entire epistle says what? My little ones, my born ones, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Even in that book, the fear is idolatry will grip this church. Now, we also have to keep in mind that idolatry is more than simply idols of physical nature. Now, these countries, cities, if you will, that were prominent in the land of Israel had often local idols, and quite often they were idols based on something very physical, a god who was a fish, sun gods, moon gods, things you could see. And that really is, at its essence, what idolatry can be. The replacement of God with something else that is unworthy of him, and that something else is usually something we can see, taste, touch, feel, grasp. And as We've been told time and time again, in quoting Calvin, the heart is an idle factory. It will crank them out. It will crank them out one at a time. But my experience with New Testament idolatry and 21st century idolatry is this. It's often a replacement of the invisible God and the Christ we cannot currently see with something that we can feel, taste, touch, or hold. We like to see it, we like to show it off, we like to have its physical presence with us. Now that does not mean we don't have certain symbology. There's nothing wrong with the fact that on the top of our steeple is a cross. It's a nice hangout for our our hawk couple that live up there. If you ever drive by and see the hawks, they hang there. That's where they can get a good view of most of their domain. Are we idolizing something because we have a physical cross? I don't think so. When we think of it correctly as a symbol of our faith and as a symbol of what Christ has done for us, then I think that's okay to have a cross. I don't think it's an idol to have a crucifix around your neck. But there is, we have to admit, a temptation to trust in something that we can feel, taste, touch, or hold. And that becomes unworthy of this God. Now, chapter 13 really begins back in chapter 12. Let's look at verse 29 before we get into our passage here. 29 through 32 of chapter 12 are transition verses that get us into this new sermon. Verse 29, When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care, one of Moses' favorite phrases in this book, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? that I also may do the same. Notice the language. This is being ensnared. It is being trapped. It is being imprisoned. How do we go about doing this? He says, don't even begin with curious thoughts about how these people groups worship their God. Now, you have to know what they did to avoid it. But this is the idea of something Just beyond my reach, I wonder what it was like. And notice, you want to worship the gods of nations that have been dispossessed by the living and true God? 
Those gods already lost. Dagon keeps falling off his little stool. They have already been defeated and their gods. Why would you trust them? Verse 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Notice the primary impetus for idolatry throughout the scriptures as I see it. The primary impetus, or at least the primary um, invasionary tactic of the evil one is this. He doesn't start by telling you to worship a false god. He starts by telling you to worship the true God in a false way. The temptation here was to go back to these gods, examine this culture, and that's really cool. That's amazing. Wow, that was really a picturesque way to go about service. How about we worship Yahweh like that? That's the temptation. And it almost always leads into outright debauched, idolatrous living. You don't worship the Lord your God that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they have even burned their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. And later in Israel's history, some of them would do the same abominable thing. And it all started with maybe we can worship Yahweh this way. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Now that leads us into chapter 13, obviously. In chapter 13, we have three major appeals that are going to come to the people of Israel to go into idolatry. And this temptation to apostasy comes on these multiple fronts. Front number one, we might call ecclesiastical. Let's look at verse one. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. This first temptation actually comes from the people of God themselves. This is an in-house temptation to idolatry. If there is a prophet or a dreamer who arises among you. Now let's look at these terms, prophet and dreamer. Won't take a lot of time. The word prophet there is the common Old Testament word for prophet. And basically a prophet in the Old Testament was not just a foreteller. He was a forth teller. God had revealed something to him. He was speaking the word of the Lord, usually the word of the Lord to a very specific people. God called most of the minor prophets, for example, to go to a very specific people and talk to them. Jerusalem, Judea, Israel, and other peoples. A dreamer of dreams is someone who has received a vision from God through a dream and then also tells people what that dream reveals. So you have these two categories. If it happens that you have a prophet who comes among you or a dreamer of dreams who comes among you and they give you a sign or a wonder, an amazing statement or a wonderful thing. And notice verse two. And the sign or wonder he tells you comes to pass. This dreamer tells you in the next three days this is going to happen. And it happened. This prophet says to you, 
God's gonna do such and such a thing, and he does, even if that's true. And this person tells you, let's go after other gods. He is a false prophet and a false dreamer of dreams, even if what he said came true. Because the ultimate test is not your observation of what may be a fulfilled statement. It is not the culmination of a sign or a wonder. The ultimate test is, what has God said? You have to have the ultimate test outside of you. That fixed star must be the word of God. And does not Paul say the same thing to the Galatians? If I or an angel from heaven come and preach to you another gospel than the one you've heard, what does Paul say? Let him be anathema, or let him be cursed. And he says, if you didn't get it the first time, get it the second time. If I or an angel from heaven come to you and tell you something contrary to this gospel, let that person be forever cursed. Now, folks, what's your relationship with the word of God? You look around at a culture. Boy, what a culture we live in. There are amazing things in our culture, and it's not all bad. It's not all bad. I was amazed at the beach. I'm always amazed when I go to the beach, and this time I was really amazed. When I was younger, as a dad, and went to the pool or the beach, I would see a whole lot of moms around and a bunch of kids, and I knew where the dads were. They were all playing golf. It's Hilton Head. I'm not seeing that so much anymore. We were commenting on the fact that we were seeing so many dads, many of them young dads, incredibly engaged with their kids, patiently playing with them, spending lots of time with them, and I thought to myself, not everything about this culture is horrendously, blasphemously horrible. There's some common grace going on here. We can look at our culture and see a lot of cool things. And we can look at our culture and see a lot of corrupt things. What is the temptation? The temptation is to look to the culture and find ways to incorporate that culture into the worship of Yahweh. Now we can utilize certain aspects of the culture to our advantage. I'm glad God invented microphones, the one here and the one around my head. I'm glad that we have capability to post this sermon to YouTube. I'm glad we have all kinds of modern technology. There are elements of our culture that we can incorporate and should. But that's not what Moses is talking about. He's talking about going into a country, into a city, having vanquished that people group, and still saying, you know, they were doing some pretty cool things with that worship thing. You know, their priests were, man, those robes were kicking, I'm telling you. I love those robes those guys are wearing. Man. And you know, wow, that, 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 that whole thing they were doing with the food, man, that was neat. And I love the stained glass, and I love the pipe organ, and I love this, and I love the praise band, and isn't it cool that the drummer has to be encased in plexiglass because he doesn't, he's playing so loud he's driving us nuts? I think that's actually kind of cool too. And the next thing you know, we've got an entire cultural shift here, and we are asked to pick and choose as to which of those aspects actually inform us of how to involve the congregation in the true worship of Yahweh. That's a hard, that's, a, that's really hard to know, right? Right, it's hard to know. I'm telling you, it is difficult to know. But the one thing this passage does tell us is when it comes to elements of religiosity, when it comes to elements of worship, when it comes to elements of worshiping a God, we do not import them. And there are things that this culture loves, things that this culture worships, things that this culture tells us that we are forbidden to bring into the worship of Yahweh. Now notice, if a prophet or a dreamer arises among you, and that's the major theme of New Testament idolatry, is that the propensity to idolatry comes our way through people who are actually elders, teachers. What Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, 
I'm telling you, from among your ranks, there will rise up ravening, vicious wolves who are going to rend and tear the flock from your elder group. And what do they say? Let's go after other gods. And what is God doing? Testing. Now don't take this as saying God is tempting you to evil. James makes it clear God never does that. But God in his permissive will is allowing these dreamers to come along and these false prophets to come along and he's allowing them to do some things that actually come true. What does God want to know? He wants to know, do I have your heart? Is your heart and your soul inclined toward me? Do you love me? And as we heard last week, out of that love that I have for you, Christ living his life through you, do you love your neighbor as yourself? That's what I want to know. And those prophets were to be put to death. They were to be extinguished from the camp. It's tragic when something can arise from a body of believers that causes people to move toward idolatry. But how about the second one? In verses 6 through 11, this temptation to apostasy and idolatry can actually come within your own family. Verse 6 If your brother, and he wants to make it clear, I'm not just talking about your brother Israelite. If your brother, the son of your mother, I'm talking about your flesh and blood brother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend who is as as your own soul, that is bosom buddy, friend who is so close he's almost like a family member. Those five, brother, son, daughter, wife, friend. If they entice you secretly within the tents, in private conversation, around the family table, entice you secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the one end of the earth to the other. All kinds of false gods. It doesn't matter where they are. You shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him. And some people might wish that he had stopped there, but he didn't. Verse 9. But you shall kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death, casting the first stone. And afterward the hand of all the people... You shall stone him to death with stones because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. And all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. What a heartbreak it is for family members to attempt to draw other family members away from the living God. Now, let's be clear about what we're not talking about. We're not talking about your son, who is also a believer, growing up and perhaps having a slightly different view of some things religious than you have. They might have some standard that they don't hold to that you've always held to. That's just part of life, folks. And for those of you who have kids you know it's part of life. Not every one of you has, every, has a child who does every single thing exactly the way you did it. And the fact that they don't doesn't mean they're idolaters. Okay, let's get that straight. It simply means they may have seen something differently than you saw it in your generation. Now, I'm not saying those things are all good, nor am I saying everything that I adhere to is always the right thing. I learn things from the Bible every day. What I'm saying is we're not supposed to go out and start stoning people just because they don't agree with us, especially a family member. But what I am saying is the fact that it's a close family member to whom you have close ties and great affection and deep love 
even if they entice you away from what the Word of God actually says about God and about his Christ, you can't listen to it. And you cannot allow sentimentality to turn you aside. I mean, think of this group. A brother, son, daughter, wife, closest of friends. We all have those in one shape or another. And they entice you to turn from the faith. You can't listen, folks. You can't listen. There's a third category we might call societal. There's been an ecclesiastical attempt through prophets and seers to draw you away. There's been a familial attempt, close family, close friends to draw you away. What about an entire city, an entire society? What are they doing to draw you away? Verse 12. Now if you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God is giving you to dwell there, that certain worthless fellows have gone out among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of the city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, then you shall get on your horse and go wipe them out immediately. No, not what he says. Then you shall inquire, make search, and ask diligently. You don't go after people on the rumor of apostasy. You've got to find out if it's true. And behold, if it be true and certain that such an abomination has been done among you, you shall surely put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, devoting them to destruction, all who are in it, and all its cattle with the edge of the sword. You shall gather all its spoil into the midst of its open square, and burn the city and all its spoil with fire, as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It's a part of worship. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. None of the devoted things shall stick to your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as he swore to your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping all his commandments that I am commanding you today and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. There are times when an entire city, an entire culture, if you will, rises up and entices you to serve false gods. And it happens all the time. Well, what are the responses? This passage gives us a real clear one. The responses to apostasy, first of all, must be exacting. And by exacting, I mean thorough. That passage that indicates how you investigate. One translation puts it this way. You inquire, you investigate, you interrogate. In other words, you be sure that this truly is apostasy. Now, let's delineate a few things. By apostasy or calling someone to idolatry, we're talking about someone enticing you to turn from the true and living God to turn to something else. Now, we have people in churches all over this country who, one, may have a false view of something because they simply don't understand the Scripture as well as they could understand it. That doesn't mean they're a heretic. It doesn't mean they're an idolater. It doesn't mean that we stone them. It doesn't mean we shun them. We instruct them. We help them to see the Word of God more clearly. Secondly, in our circles, we have very good people who love this book and who love Jesus Christ and who love God and are seeking as best as they know how to practice their church ecclesiology in a way that they believe the Bible teaches, and we don't necessarily see it that way. I know, having talked to him, that the pastor of our Lutheran neighbor where is he here? He's, he's right back there. The pastor, our Lutheran neighbor, is a gospel-preaching man. And I know right now at First Presbyterian Church in Greenville, the gospel's being preached. And I'm not a Lutheran, and I'm not a Presbyterian, and I don't see church ecclesiology in that light. They do. And you know what? Eternity may reveal to me that I was wrong. I don't know. But I do know this. There are things about which the Bible is absolutely, unequivocally clear. 
and to depart from that is to fall away from the living God. And there are also denominations and churches that preach those things, and that is an allurement to apostasy and idolatry. It takes discernment. It takes discernment. You investigate, you interrogate, you find out the truth. And that thoroughness is then followed up with tenacity. Folks, it must be expunged. Now, in remaining time, let's talk about how you handle apostasy in both testaments. What is the proper motivation? This passage gives us three major motivations for love for the Father evidenced by adherence to his principles and his truth. One is love for God and God's love for you. You are motivated because you love this God and when he speaks, you listen. When he speaks, you obey. Study sometime the life of Josiah, the young king. Scripture describes him in a very interesting way. It's one of the few, if only, persons in the Old Testament that really is described as someone who really sought the Lord with his whole heart. Someone who really did love this God. And so he's reading in the scriptures as a young king, and he sees this God, and this God comes alive to him. And he understands who this God is, and then he looks around and sees what? All kinds of idolatrous things going on. And so his love for this God prompts him to have reforms in the land of Israel that resulted in the ashtra being tossed aside and the, the heaps being driven away and the groves and all that stuff are all wiped out. In other words, the idea is his love for this God and his understanding of this God's character caused him then to be that tenacious in terms of I can't abide this happening in my country. And have you noticed how many times already in the book of Deuteronomy a motivation has been redemption? Remember, remember, I brought you out of Egypt. 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 Don't forget that I redeemed you. Folks, we fight against idolatry. We fight against apostasy. We fight against false teaching because we have been redeemed by a loving and gracious and good God. And we must obey him. And is God's character not also a motivation? God in this very passage talks about, I want to show you mercy. I want to show you grace. I want to restore you. I'm going to do good things for you. And we have to get past some of the severity of the punishments that God prescribed for that time and that place, which were absolutely necessary and are not New Testament prescriptions. And sometimes we stumble over that. But one thing we can never stumble over is the concept, this is a God who is love. This is a God who is grace. This is a God who is mercy. And he acts that way all the time to his people. And because of his goodness, because of his grace, because of his redemption, we say, Lord, how can we serve you best? And when we see that which is unworthy of him cropping up in our church, in our thought lives, in our practices, in the way we conduct church, when it happens in our homes, we have to stop and say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound to me like the God who saves, the God who redeems, the God who sends grace, the God who extends mercy. It's not like him, we cannot go there. Spurgeon said, false gods patiently endure the existence of other false gods. Dagon can stand with Bel, and Bell with Ashtoreth, how should stone and wood and silver be moved to indignation? But because God is the only living and true God, Dagon must fall before his ark. Bell must be broken, and Ashtoreth must be consumed with fire, because we serve the only living, true God. He said, well, Pastor, what am I going to do? I don't have an Astra. Show me where the nearest temple to Bell is and I'll go take care of business. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a mental attitude of devotion to the God of heaven that says I will not tolerate false teaching, false worship in my family, my home, or in this church. 
Now, the New Testament writers provide us guidance. If you'll turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, Paul's epistle to Titus. And Titus chapter 1 is Paul's instruction to his apostolic uh, appointee, Titus, who's going to Crete to help further establish the fledgling churches of Crete. Verse 5 of chapter 1, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what, re, uh, what remained into order. Go fix things. Get things set up right. And appoint elders in every town. Pastor teachers, I believe, are equivalent to that. Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must be, not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Those are the qualifications for the office of pastor, elder, bishop. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound, healthy doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Two main things. He teaches what's right. He refutes what's wrong. Why? Verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, the Judaizers, if you will. They must be silenced King James, their mouths must be stopped. <laughs> it's not, we're not talking about pussyfooting around here. You shut them up. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. They're doing it for the money. He says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, a poet, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This is one of the funniest passages in Scripture, verse 13. This testimony is true. <laughs> it's like, Paul's like, how to win friends and influence people. This guy says this about the Cretans, and he's right. They're like this. I'm like, wow, poor Cretans. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. You have a characteristic in this nation, a characteristic in this culture that is not diligent. Rebuke them sharply, that they may be in sound in the faith, healthy in the faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth, not devoting themselves to false teaching that leads to idolatry. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds, false teachers' minds, and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now what I'm surprised about in the scripture is, in both testaments, how much time is devoted to false teaching as a concept that must be attacked. It is all over the scriptures. In virtually every epistle it's addressed. If you look at the epistle of Jude, it's the really only topic that is addressed. The entire second chapter of 2 Peter, that's the whole chapter. It's over and over and over again. And what does Paul, John say in his great loving first epistle of John? If anyone, try the spirits, if anyone comes to you and doesn't say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, if someone comes to you with a false doctrine about the person and work of Christ, reject that person. Don't listen to them. I am called as an elder, pastor, overseer, to help protect this flock. And I do so by marking what false teachers are like. Well, they're numerous. They're all over the place. They're rebellious. They're insubordinate. This passage indicates they're empty talkers. This passage indicates they're deceitful. This passage indicates they're legalistic. And read 2 Peter chapter 2 sometimes. But false prophets also arose 
among the people. They can be here at White Oak, folks. I love how Peter goes on to say, they are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They pick on the most vulnerable in the flock. They attack vulnerable saints. They attack privately. Their message is often things like Jewish myths, false commands, aestheticism. Other messages can include the aberrant teachings about Jesus, things that resulted in something like a prosperity gospel, all kinds of things. And what do they do? It reflects the baseness of the culture at large, of course. These people are not believers. They're unbelievers. They're corrupt. They're hypocrites. They're detestable. They're disobedient. And they are to be denounced. He said, well, what about Jesus Christ? Pastor, you're not talking like Jesus. All right, let's talk like Jesus. Turn to chapter 11 of Luke's gospel. Now get this picture. Verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. This Pharisee invited Jesus to supper. Come on over. I got some Chick-fil-A coming, I guess. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. I think Jesus did this deliberately. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Now wait, Jesus, you're, he just invited you to his house. Come in, cut the man a little slack. This is the same Jesus who says, learn of me for my heart. The description of his heart is what? I am meek and lowly of heart. That's this Jesus. You fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb. You go through all the tiniest little, tiniest little things you've got and you make a tithe of them. And you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done, keep on tithing, without neglecting the other. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you're like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. Okay, so... I mean, he's killing the Pharisees here, just absolutely leveling them with both barrels. One of the lawyers, scribes, we learned about that last week. One of the scribes answered him, Teacher, in, these, in saying these things, you insult us also. Jesus said, okay, verse 46. And he said, woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You don't help anybody, you just weigh them down. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets with whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. The words of Jesus to false teachers. And they have to be silenced. But we rebuke them in love. We try to bring them back. And we try to silence the false teachers primarily by living the lives of true teachers. When we go to Jude, 
Verse 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who are in doubt. When you have someone that's being led astray, who's not sure what's going on, a fledgling believer who's tossed to and fro, reading all kinds of weird stuff on the internet, hearing all kinds of aberrant messages on television and radio, you have mercy on them, and you save others by snatching them out of the fire. You drunk jerk them away from that danger. And on others you show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And in what attitude? An attitude of eternity. How does Jude end this epistle? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy. This is the one I'm talking about, the one who's able to keep you, sustain you, and present you blameless to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever, amen. That's the God whose testimony we are protecting. That is the God we're supposed to be proclaiming. And when you have the vision of that God, you do not go out in anger and viciousness and, and, and uh, out of control derision attacking false teachers. You in love go and you correct. You correct. You provide the alternative through a holy life and you proclaim, you proclaim this God who's able to save to the uttermost. Now, how many of us in here are married or have been married? How many of you are currently married? I'll, I'll focus on the men for a minute. Do you love your wife? I do. What is your response when you hear your wife denigrated? What might be your response if you heard her attacked? What might be your response if someone were to attempt to lure you away from her? Now folks, magnify that response. And think about what it means for someone to entice other people away from the true and living God. What a horrible thing to do. These passages can sound very angry, and I hope I haven't come across to you as being totally angry. But there is such a thing as righteous indignation. There is a wrath that is indeed holy. And I want you to think about the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you, forgave you, redeemed you, cleansed you, bought you with his own blood. Will you not be zealous for his testimony? And will you not be zealous in keeping it beyond arm's length those kinds of doctrines that would bring him into disrepute? That's really what we're talking about here, folks. A love for God that will not stand or abide that which is false to him. Let's pray. I'll give you a moment to respond. by asking perhaps a couple of questions? Is there something right now that's a part of this culture 
that has its hooks in you and it's drawing you away from the true worship of the living God? Is there anything in your life right now that keeps you from loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself? We thank you, Father, that your word's so clear. And it can be hard, Father, to apply principles from a book like Deuteronomy to 21st century life in upstate South Carolina. It's not always an easy thing. But Father, we know this. The God of Deuteronomy is gracious and merciful and loving and kind, and he has redeemed his people, and they are the apple of his eye. And so are we. And Father, help our love for you to be so fervent and so burning and so bright and so radiant that that in itself becomes a testimony to the hope that is within us. And Father, help us not to glory or take glee in seeing false teachers stumble, but rather, Father, may we be encouraged by your word to remember we too were slaves in Egypt. We too have been bought and brought out of that slave house which is sin. And we too have been born again by the living word. And Father, because of that, we simply cannot abide idolatry or that teaching of doctrine which is aberrant and abhorrent and deceitful and destructive. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.